Well, that's a very unusual way for me to start a video, but there's a mouse on the screen, and it's a mother mouse. And there's actually a really important reason for this. This mouse just made scientific history. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're actually going to be discussing what's really happening in this picture, and discuss this relatively recent study you can find in a description that was able to recreate parthenogenesis. The concept of so-called virgin birth. In other words, being born without the participation of a father. Something that obviously forms the basis for religions like Christianity, but more importantly, something that we know exists scientifically as well in a lot of different species, and scientists have actually been trying to figure out how exactly it works for mammals, and if it's possible to sort of enforce it on different mammals without causing any problems. So let's discuss some of these studies in more detail, and some of the new discoveries from the last few years as well. But naturally, let's start with the concept and the word itself, parthenogenesis. With the word parthenos meaning virgin, and the word genesis obviously meaning creation. And the thing about virgin birth is that it obviously has its pros and cons. For example, one benefit of being able to produce offspring without the participation of a father relates to the idea of asexual reproduction that's going to be a separate video on its own later on. In this case, being able to produce something without actual sexes and create offspring through the process of cloning, in some sense, is actually beneficial in terms of saving energy. Asexual reproduction in general is a lot more efficient at producing offspring than sexual reproduction, but it also has a lot of issues in terms of evolution. By having sexes, we introduce the mixing of genes, and this of course increases the chance for mutations and thus allows for various species to survive much longer in harsh conditions. Although that's obviously a very simple way of saying why this is important. There are a lot of other reasons for sexual reproduction, and in more complex organisms, it actually also introduces the idea of a kind of a competition between the sexual genes. So, for example, in humans and some of the more complex mammals, the X and Y genes start to kind of compete with each other for certain functions as the cells divide. It's a concept that's still being studied and still is not understood entirely, but it's a concept that's underlined in this new study as well. Nevertheless, we know that there are quite a lot of species on the planet that do rely on parthenogenesis and do rely on asexual reproduction at least to some extent. In this case, usually using some kind of an unfertilized egg cell in order to start the reproduction process and to then create a kind of a clone of the mother. This process is quite common in a lot of different plants, although it's usually known as apomixis and not parthenogenesis, and by itself is already a pretty complex idea as well. But I'm really more interested in animal life, and specifically complex animal life. And we know that there are quite a lot of species that rely on parthenogenesis, at least to some extent. For example, there are quite a lot of different species of different types of worms and nematodes. There are some species of amphibians, such as frogs, several different species of bees, and several species of wasps, including different parasitic wasps, and quite a lot of reptiles as well. As a matter of fact, the so-called New Mexico whiptail that you see right here is one of the better known examples of this particular process in more complex animals. But more recently, the scientists have also found several types of birds that occasionally go through parthenogenesis, and there are quite a lot of well-known cases of different sharks going through this as well, usually in some sort of an enclosed setting, such as a huge fish tank or some kind of a sea world. But it's relatively rare for different animals to have this as a kind of a default way of reproduction, or essentially having it as the only way of reproduction. Normally, animals only rely on this when there is no other alternative, such as, for example, no more male species around. For example, certain types of mayflies that you see right here rely on this process when there are no males around and when the habitat is essentially all females. And because these insects don't usually live very long, they have no other choice but to start reproducing using parthenogenesis. But in more complex animals, especially animals like sharks, like certain types of fish, usually it's a result of a certain error. In other words, it's an accident. Certain asexual eggs are produced through the process of certain meiotic errors where the eggs become activated and start to divide. And so there are actually very, very few species where it is mandatory, where the males sort of disappeared. In most cases, if it happens, it's usually by accident. Although we'll discuss a little bit more about this in one of the other videos about the asexual reproduction, where certain animals, such as certain stick insects, turned asexual for quite a long period of time, but then reversed and became sexual again. 
But that's of course in regards to the natural process and how it works in nature. But we also have this other side, the scientific curiosity. And the scientists have always been curious to see if they can actually create this artificially. In other words, if they can induce parthenogenesis and cause a certain animal to start producing offspring without a participation of the male. And the first case of successful induced parthenogenesis belongs to Gregory Pincus, you see right here, who did this back in 1936. Inducing parthenogenesis in a common rabbit. Although the actual details and the actual process is not entirely clear because it's never really been recreated again. So in that sense, we don't really know exactly what happened to that rabbit and how exactly it became pregnant and created offspring. It could have been through some other process. However, the experiment in Japan in 2004 was very successful in producing the offspring of a mouse. And in this case, they did so by targeting two specific genes, two specific loci, and were able to create a fatherless mouse who allegedly even had enhanced longevity. In other words, the scientists implied that the mouse was much healthier than any other mouse. But in this case, it took hundreds of trials, and normally these experiments resulted in some kind of a unusual formation, or more often some kind of an abnormality inside the organism. And so, in many different cases, the results from parthenogenesis experiments were not really that successful. They would usually produce some kind of an organism, but it would normally not really be fully developed or fully functioning. And this was the case for many different experiments in the last decade using either mice or monkeys. And the main reason behind this is really because of the complexity of mammalian genes. It's believed that when sexual reproduction happens, various chromosomes are inactivated through the process of competition between maternal and paternal genes. In other words, in a normal cell, usually either the X chromosome or the Y chromosome are going to activate a certain part of the gene. And by directly activating certain regions of the genes, that's when the normal development happens. And moreover, when parthenogenesis starts to accidentally occur in humans, or when the cell starts to divide by itself without the presence of paternal genes, it normally results in a relatively serious issue that's described in a little bit more detail in this study right here. It results in a type of a growth known as teratoma and can actually create some serious problems for the mother because it becomes a very dangerous growth. And one of the reasons it becomes problematic is because it cannot actually create certain types of cells. For example, no skeletal muscle, only some parts of the blood cells, but not all of the cells required for the normal creation or formation of a human embryo. In other words, without that competition between the paternal genes and the maternal genes, normal development of a human being practically becomes impossible. So, in that sense, parthenogenesis might not be possible with humans. However, there is at least one interesting example from 1995. You can read a little bit more about this in this older article from New Scientists. And it's about some young boy, obviously not this boy, this is just a stock footage, who was having some developmental difficulty and also had some facial asymmetry along with certain learning difficulties. The boy was otherwise healthy, but he did have certain problems. And when the parents tested the boy's genes, it was discovered that the boy was actually partially parthenogenic. Certain cells in his body were created through this process of virgin birth. Certain other cells were actually fertilized, but not all of them. Suggesting, of course, that this was a type of a partial parthenogenesis. For example, his white blood cells did not have any genetic components from the father with certain other types of cells also being entirely free of genetic material from the father. But other cells were fertilized and contained the material from both parents. And what the scientists believe happened in this case, well, it was most likely a result of parthenogenesis that started first, but then, as the cells were already dividing, the sperm most likely fertilized certain parts of the cells, and so only partial fertilization happened in this embryo. But the embryo in this case got really lucky because it was the important parts that became fertilized, whereas some other parts that were not as essential remaining in their virgin state. Which makes this boy a kind of a scientific wonder. Essentially, inside this boy's body, there are two different lineages of cells. One being a clone of the mother, and one being a mixture of father and mother. In more scientific terms, he is known as a parthenogenic chimera. And since then, in the last few decades, quite a few of these cases have been identified, meaning that it's not actually that rare after all. 
although usually their names are hidden for obvious reasons, and so we don't really know exactly what happens in most cases. But apart from being just a scientific curiosity, there's actually a somewhat practical reason for why scientists want to learn more about parthenogenesis in regards to biology and in regards to medicine. At least in theory, this process can actually facilitate the creation of various types of stem cells, which could then be used in different types of regenerative treatment. And so in this recent study, that's essentially why the scientists wanted to recreate this using mice. And looks like they were quite successful. And that's pretty much exactly what you see in this image. This is a mouse that was produced through parthenogenesis, and as you can see, it later became a mother as well, meaning that it was a functional offspring and was not in any way abnormal genetically or physically. And in this case, the scientists behind the study achieved this by being able to control the expression of genes and their activity. They used a new technique known as epigenetic rewriting in order to achieve this without damaging the embryo. And so instead of changing the actual genes, in this case, this technique only alters the way that the genes express as the embryo grows. In other words, it sort of mimics the same processes that usually happen inside the body naturally as the genes between mother and father compete. But they were able to do so only once out of many, many different cases, meaning that they still basically got lucky. But more importantly, this particular example once again proves that when it comes to the developing offspring, it's sort of the combination of various types of competition between paternal genes and maternal genes that seem to create perfect offspring later on. Something that the scientists were able to recreate here using methylation rewriting techniques. A technique that one day could be used on more complex animals as well. It presents an opportunity for different types of new medicine, including stem cell medicine, and more importantly, it also offers opportunities for different infertility treatments as well. But all of this, of course, at least for now, only works for mice and only one mouse out of a hundred. So this is still in its infancy and it's still a process that will take decades to develop and to perfect. And on top of this, the ethical implications from this are also pretty serious as well. Chances are, the concept here is only going to remain in the realm of science and in the realm of using this on animals. But still a pretty interesting and a pretty intriguing case. A mouse that was born without a father. A virgin mouse. And a mouse that seems to be doing quite okay. Well anyway, on that note, check out the study and all of the relevant links in the description below. And we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about asexual reproduction and certain other cases of different types of reproduction in different types of animals in some of the future videos. On that note, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.